what I want to talk to you about is a comprehensive approach to assessment of executive function. That'll include not only the assessment piece, but also the intervention piece. And notice on the bottom of the first image, I have my email and my websites. Um, I want to extend to you a, a, a welcome. Um, by the way, this is across the street. Uh, this is the Chesapeake Bay on one of those really beautiful blue sky days. Um, I encourage you to go to my website, jacknaglieri.com. There's so much information there, but there isn't a single thing that you can buy. Everything is free. Copies of articles, copies of chapters, all kinds of handouts, webinars you can watch. You can see some of the handouts from my Helping Children Learn book, the, the interventions. You can read the first chapter or two from my Essentials of Cast to Assessment book. There's a lot of information there, so feel free to, to dig into that. Um, but this is what I like to do uh, today. First, I'm gonna kind of introduce the concept of EF, executive function. And then we're gonna look at ways of evaluating EF based upon behaviors, observable behaviors. Then we're gonna talk about the relationship between EF and intelligence. Is EF a kind a part of intelligence? Then we're gonna talk about EF and social emotional. I know a lot of people like to talk about social emotional learning or social emotional skills. I think we should talk about social emotional cognition. Uh, we will talk a little bit about e EF and academic and job performance. And then we're gonna look at some research that ties it all together really very nicely. And that'll be, that'll be it for the evening. Now, um, as we go through, you can raise your hand, you can just say, I have a question. However you wanna do it, it's perfectly fine with me. But let's, let's just talk a little bit about why this session on EF. I think that EF is probably the most important ability that we have because it's really all about the decision-making that we use when we try to solve a problem. And I think maybe one of the best things about EF is that I'll show you the research I've done where if you can help students better utilize EF and the impact it has on academics. And it will change the course of a, of a student's life. When you really help a student understand, a person understand the importance of being strategic about everything they do, that's a wonderful life lesson. That's what EF is. Now, I'm going to talk about four aspects of EF. So a comprehensive measure, sorry, a comprehensive assessment of executive function should include at least these four components. The first would be behaviors related to cognition, like a typical rating scale, behaviors related to social emotional skills, academic and job skills, and then the foundation of EF is neurocognitive ability. In other words, intelligence. So if you think about it, if a person isn't very strong in this concept of EF, in other words, the frontal lobes, for whatever reason, aren't providing the depth and breadth that are necessary, you should see 
evidence of that across many different domains. And that's what we're going to look at, look about. Sorry, that's what we're going to talk about today. But let's just kind of get um, a little bit of history. If you've never read about Phineas Gage, I recommend this very uh, short book by John Fleischman. What I like about the book is it's very authoritative, but almost reads like a novel. It makes it a lot of fun to find, to get a feel for this person who has really had a huge impact um, on psychology. And Fleischman says before the accident, before that tamping iron went through his head and out the top of his frontal lobe, he was seen as a man with a well-balanced mind, being a shrewd, smart businessman, very energetic and persistent in executing all his plans of operation. After this, the accident that he had, his ability to direct others was gone. He couldn't get along with other people. He couldn't work. His behaviors were odd and difficult. He changed dramatically. Another really good book for you to read would be Nick Goldberg's book, The New Executive Brain. Of course, higher cortical functions is where Luria was one of the first people to even talk about the frontal lobes. Luria described them as the organ of civilization. Wow, that's a profound description. And Nick is a little bit more, I think, um, down to earth describing the frontal lobes as related to leadership and sex differences and self-awareness and self-correction and creativity, maturity, interpersonal maturity, and certainly learning. So these are some good resources for you. Um, when we were working on our executive function handbook, I wrote a chapter where we kind of reviewed what do people say about this concept. And what was really interesting is there were so many different definitions of EF. And it wasn't like everybody was agreeing. Some people said EF was, a, was one thing with a lot of little parts. Some people said EF was many, many parts. My friend George McCluskey talks about 40 some odd executive functions. And some people said it's one thing, but a lot of little parts. And there's all kinds of confusion about that. So when I started to work on the comprehensive executive function inventory, the CEFI, I said to the publisher and to my co-author, Sam Goldstein, we have to answer the question, is it executive function singular or functions plural? Now, this is not an esoteric argument or a concept. In fact, it's very practical because you have to decide based upon what score you're going to use if you would say this child is good or struggling in, in EF. So one of the great things about being a test author is you have tons of data from the validity studies and from the standardization samples. So I decided that what we would do is test the hypothesis, executive function or functions with our data. And that's what we did. We used the CEFI and we had so many, we had a lot of ratings by teachers, and parents and for the older groups, self ratings and other ratings. Um, we had so much data that we were able to split our data in half and do two different kinds of analyses. One at the item level and one at the scale level, like subtests. And what we found was that when you looked at the CEFI for children about whether it's by um, ratings by teachers, by parents, 
or self ratings, you got a one factor solution. That said, EF is not all about the different parts. It's one thing. But we have the adults, Safi. So basically the same thing, same kind of organization, same, basically the same items, but a little, you know, modified a bit for the adult environment. And we did our analyses there, got the same results. So what we had is these four groups of data, almost 7,000 people who represent the US population. And every time we ask the question, regardless of the rater, regardless of the way in which you did the analyses or the age, we always got EF, one dimensional test. So even though our scale has a separate score for working memory and attention and planning and so on and so forth, none of those parts by themselves are gonna tell you if the child is struggling or super good in EF. It's the total score only that tells you that. So when you learn the CEPHI and you're deciding how you're going to interpret it, you interpret the big score, the total one. The parts just help you understand the big score. <clears throat> and our definition of EF is how you do what you decide to do. How you do what you decide to do. Does it involve initiation and planning and organization and self-control and attention and all those things? Yes. But anyone alone is not sufficient. So for example, this is the first case we ever came across with the CEPI. And uh, this is one of Sam Goldstein's is that he evaluated. And as you can see, the standard scores are ranging from 82 to 112. And we have a way of analyzing all these scores to determine if the scores are significantly different or not. And what we find is that the emotional regulation score is a significant weakness. But that does not mean the student as an EF problem. In fact, this student did not. The average, the overall score was 102. But with further investigation, Sam concluded that, in fact, the student had an anxiety disorder that was really coming out with items related to emotional regulation. Now, many people, my colleagues who have different tests, don't agree. They'll, they'll look at all the parts and say a lot of things about them. I think that's a mistake. The data tell us only the total score is what we should use. Now, a couple of other things about the CEFI, which makes them these the CEFI unique, is the items are strength-based. So the items are positively worded. Not every single item, but 90 plus percent of them are. We throw in a couple that are turned around just to make sure that people who are scoring are, you know, filling it out or are uh, doing it carefully. So the higher the score, the better. And we use the metric, an IQ metric. IQ of 100, 115, standard deviation above and so on. By the way, if you're in the schools, I think even if you weren't in the schools, if even if you're in private practice, um, there is a free EF interventions curriculum that you can access. I actually helped create this free resource. And it has all the parts. It has a like a lesson plan for all the different aspects of EF that are listed on the CEPI. And I'll just show you a little bit of how it works. So one of the lessons 
is about planning, being strategic in other words. And um, the way that it starts is the, the teacher, or if you were doing a small group activity, the psychologist, school psychologist would show a video. This happens to be a very blurry picture of one of those flash mob things where everybody starts dancing. Yes? Okay. Um, so after this, now I, I was in an alternative high school where we developed this program and I was in the classroom and I took notes of what the kids said in response to what the teachers asked. So the teachers, part of the curriculum is the teacher asks these questions. What would you have to plan out? And the kids said, well, I had to learn the dance steps. In other words, get knowledge. Um, someone had to start, in other words, initiate. What are the parts of a good plan? Think of the possible problems. Contingency management. Organize the dance. Okay. Other questions. How do you know if a plan is any good? Put it in action and see if it works. Perhaps learn by failing. What should you do if the plan isn't working? Well, fix it, self-correction. These are all parts of EF. How do you use planning in this class? We don't, the kid said. Because the teacher plans out everything for us. This is a problem. Because if you want people to use their frontal lobes, that means they have to be encouraged to think about how to do what it is they're trying to do. And unless you do that, you're just giving them something to remember, not something that they can use in the future. So this is a very, very important point. So in my book, Helping Children Learn, we have this little um, mantra here. This is something that I would give to the students that I work with who, who need to be thinking about being a little strategic. You might print this out and cut it and stick it on the kid's book or on their desk. Think smart and use a plan. Figure out how to do it. That encourages students to be strategic. That's how you engage students in EF. Now, I have a whole line of research on how to engage students so that they use their EF. And this is the, I think the best of the whole group of six or eight studies on, on this methodology I call planning facilitation, because it's not skill training, it's not direct instruction. It is facilitating on the part of the students an appreciation of the value of being thoughtful and strategic when doing, in this case, mathematics. Notice that the title is a cognitive strategy instruction to improve math calculation for children with ADHD and LD. And it's a randomized control study, which means we can say that the intervention cause the result. So the way that this worked, it was about a dozen, half an hour, roughly half an hour to 40 minute sessions conducted by the teachers, the regular teachers. And there was an experimental group and a control group. The control group got additional math instruction by the regular teachers whereas the experimental group did not get that additional math instruction, but instead got this technique, which we call planning facilitation, which works like this. The teachers were asking the students, what was your goal? Where, where did you start? What will you do next time? Did that help you get more right? Did you use any strategies? The teachers were told only to ask questions, not to say anything other than questioning. It's like solution-focused counseling, where you raise the issues, talk about it. And in our, in our um, article that we published, which is on my website, you can get this on my website if you want to read it. 
you have a whole page of all the different kinds of uh, goals and things that the students specified, things that they said, um, like checking their work and looking for the easy ones and trying not to fall asleep. Of course, that's a good thing. <laughs> but here's what we found. When we looked at pre-post math scores in the math taken from their dir directly from their curriculum, the normal instruction kids improved a little bit. The kids in the experimental group improved dramatically. But then we asked, the, did it generalize to anything? Did it transfer? Well, we gave Wyatt numerical operations standardized achievement test pre-post. And we saw the experimental group much better. Same thing for a math fluency, experimental group much better. And a year later, we went back to the school and we pulled out the achievement scores for the students at that point. And the experimental group was still better than a control group. That's how you help kids better utilize executive function. Not by telling them, not by teaching them the five steps to be a better planner, not by making them learn or remember some little silly acronym at all. No, it's all about helping them appreciate the value of being strategic. And this is just some of the studies that have been done on intervention. All right, so the, the, the bottom line is don't be the child's prefrontal cortex. We do that too much, the helicopter parents, the kids, have to be able to figure stuff out. And you give the least amount of help that you can to get the student to move forward, but not so much as what typically happens. Now I'm gonna really kind of change what you're used to, because I'm gonna say, I'm gonna talk about the relationship between EF and intelligence. I think if we define intelligence from a neurocognitive perspective, then EF is a part of intelligence. But EF is not measured by traditional IQ tests. Let me tell you a little bit about my own reflection as a 25 year old when I started working at this school, Champaign Elementary in Bethpage, New York, some years ago. Yeah, 1975. <laughs> A lot of you weren't born then. I remember wondering, okay, what's the theory behind this whisk and these Stanford Binet? I mean, don't I need to know that to interpret it? And what is this verbal and performance? That's before we had all the so many uh, explosion of scales that are in the whisk now. Um, we, you know, how, where did this come from? And what's the uh, what's the big idea? You know, Wexler had his verbal and performance scales, but he never believed in different kinds of intelligences. He just believed in general ability. How does that fit in with EF? Doesn't seem like it does. And his definition, the aggregate of global capacity of the individual act purposely, think rationally and deal effectively with his environment. Who the hell knows what that means? Interestingly, if you read some old books, which I like to do, I have Rudolf Pitner's book. Rudolf clearly said that we did not start with a clear definition of general intelligence, but borrowed from everyday life, a vague term implying all around ability and was still attempting to define it more sharply and doubt with a stricter kind of scientific connotation. Doesn't that sound familiar with all the things that Pearson is trying to do with the WISC-5 and the WISCs, eventually the WISC 6 and what the CHC folks are trying to do with all the zillions of abilities. But importantly, Rudolf Pittner said, you know, a good intelligence test was avoid as much as possible anything that's commonly learned. In a broad sense, this rests on the differentiation between knowledge and intelligence. Now, when Binet created his scales, he didn't have a theory of intelligence. There was no EF there. 
Binet did do something really important that Terman undid, by the way. Binet removed from the 1908 scale the items that depended on, as he said, depended too much on school learning when he built his 2011 scale just before he died. Terman added all that verbal stuff in because he thought that verbal and abstract levels were the highest form of mental ability. But there's no theory, there's no EF there. But there was Terman's student, Arthur Otis, who was instrumental in the development of the Army Alpha and the Army Beta. And then there's this 20 something military examiner called David Wexler, who just stole from the Army Mental Test Book to create the WISC. So there's no executive function anywhere near here. There's no theory here. It's just a mishmash of stuff that Terman thought should be in there and Binet thought shouldn't be. But doesn't it make sense that EF should, should be part of intelligence? And I love this definition from this man, Edwin Boring. Unfortunately, if you have a name like, a last name like Boring, but you're writing a history book, maybe you should change your last name. You know? <laughs> but, but seriously, we've been using these tests and trying to attach theories of intelligence to them. WJ, the Bay, the WISC, especially the WISC. But here's the real important thing that you need to know if you're learning the WISC. I don't know if you've read these papers, but you should. These papers that have clearly shown that the WISC subtests and scales do not have enough unique variants. In other words, they don't have anything more to tell you than the total score told you. And if they do tell you something from the total score, it's just error variance. Same is true for CHC. Um, when Benson et al. factor analyzed John Carroll's big fat book, said, nope, it's only one dimension. I know this goes against the root. A lot of people are taught these days, but that's the science. And there's study after study after study that shows that this is the case. We're being encouraged to overinterpret. We're also being encouraged to overinterpret on our executive function rating scales, just as we are with our intelligence tests. These guys, I've known all these guys like Marley Watkins. I've known him my entire career when I was working in Arizona, Gary Canavay, and so on. I know these people. I trust them. I think they're right, despite what some people would say. But could we have a measure of intelligence that includes executive function? We certainly could. That's where the cast comes in. So if you want to measure EF directly, using a neurocognitive approach, you need to learn the CAS. Cognitive assessment system, this is the first meeting that JP and I had in 1984. And that in, in that meeting, we talked about creating a different kind of IQ test, a different kind of intelligence test an intelligence test not built on the past intelligence test, but instead built on neurocognitive processes, which Luria described. We published a second edition, first, first edition and then a second edition, and we're still going strong. But let's just think about this. It, Luria talks about three functional units. First functional unit of cortical arousal and attention. Second functional unit, the back part of the brain, occipital, parietal, temporal. And then the front part of the brain, of course, that's your, that's your EF. 
especially this intersection of, of first and third functional units, which are highly anatomically con connected. Um, by the way, the only test that has been examined and found to be interpretable beyond the total score is the cognitive assessment system. Gary Canavay did that study some years ago, and there's a study that was just completed that's uh, out for a publication where the results, very sophisticated, very thorough examination of a cognitive assessment system, second edition data, results unambiguously support the notion that intelligence is not unidimensional, but a composite of distinct cognitive processes, planning attention simultaneous and success. So let me tell you a little bit more about these, these processes and you'll see how it relates to EF. And, uh, I think we're moving along pretty well. Um, so planning is the thinking about how you do what you decide to do and attention is being alert and resisting distractions along the way. Simultaneous processing is the kind of thinking that you use when you understand how things go together to form a whole. You could think of it like visual spatial, but it's not just visual, it could be verbal. It's like, for example, reading comprehension demands a lot of simultaneous processing to understand the meaning of a paragraph. Successive processing is all about sequencing. This is the, the process that leads to dyslexia. Why can't a student do sound blending and phonological tasks? It's because they have a temporal lobe weakness. Now, let's just pause here for a second. Look what I just did. I just explained to you a very sophisticated, powerful, highly valid theory of intelligence without using any crazy psychological terms. Why is that important? Because do you know who is the most critical person for you to inform about your test results when you give intelligence tests like the CAST? Do you know who that person is? The student. When you help a student understand their strengths, I found out that you're good at figuring out what to do when you get stuck and you can pay attention and you can see how things go together, but it's really hard for you to work with anything that's in, a, in order, in a sequence. And then you work with that student, you help them understand about using strategies like chunking and breaking down a long sequence into manageable parts. That's how you get students to use their EF to think smarter and be more successful. If you have EF in your theory of intelligence, which you should, because in a lot of ways, I think it's the most important part. So what we do with the CAS is we measure intelligence or thinking in a way that's not confounded by knowing. When you give a whisk and you decide how smart a child is based upon their vocabulary, general information, similarities, arithmetic, doesn't that make you wonder what the hell am I doing? Isn't that just achievement? Why would I use that to decide how smart somebody is? That's the fundamental, the second fundamental failure of traditional IQ. The first is not having a theory. The second is content that Terman put in doesn't make any sense because that's the same kind of stuff that you have in the achievement test that you're giving. So whenever you look at a test question on any test, you should always ask yourself, what does the student need to know to complete the task? 
And the more important part is how do they have to think? Do they have to think of a strategy? Do they have to understand how things go together? Do they have to pay attention to the small little details? Do they have to follow a sequence? That's what you need to do, look at. All right. Um, so when we talk about planning, we're talking about a neurocognitive function that's similar to things like metacognition or executive function. And it's planning, this EF, I like to use planning, you could EF is the same, same idea, goal setting, making decisions, predicting what's gonna happen, all those kinds of things. And in academic world, math calculation, certainly written expression, writing, what you do when you're trying to do a comprehensive evaluation of a student, that's so dense with planning. Planning is so important. So we have three subtests in each of the four areas. You can give the first two or all 12. In any case, it's either 40 minutes or 60 minutes to get the four scores. Very easy, a lot easier than traditional tests. Um, next is attention. Attention is the thinking that you use to focus and resist distractions. That's kind of the thing, diff the difference between listening and hearing. Sometimes we hear, but we don't listen. Attention is really important when you look at multiple choice test questions, because oftentimes they're really similar. And sometimes just a little tiny dot can make a difference whether it's right or wrong. You gotta notice those details. For, a lot of intricate work, really involves a lot of attention. Again, three different kinds of, of subtests. Um, we do use the Stroop as one of our measures of attention because it fits our definition of the kind of thinking that's required for our test that should measure attention. And then um, we have simultaneous processing, occipital parietal. And this is, if you remember your Gestalt psychology, that's simultaneous processing, where things all fit together and all of a sudden it makes a whole. Free comprehension, definitely geometry, math word problems, learning whole language, learn to read by whole language, verbal concepts, all that kind of stuff very much involves simultaneous processing. And um, I'll just draw attention to one thing. We have a nonverbal simultaneous processing test, a verbal one, and one that requires memory. Think about that for a second. All of our tests on the CAS vary in their content, even though they're all on the respective same scales because it's about the thinking that you use, not the content of the test questions that matters. And successive processing, temporal lobe, all about doing things in order. Like when you learn to tie your shoe, when you learn any kind of a motor movements, speech articulation. Uh, we used to have to remember phone numbers, but we really don't have to do that anymore. When someone tells you do this, then do this, then do this, then do this, that could be a real problem. Academics, phonological. When, when people say to me, oh, this child has dyslexia because they failed Joe Torgerson's phonological coding test, I say, no, that's the symptom, not the cause. The cause is successive processing. They can't do the phonological task because they can't work with anything in order. That's why they can't do sound letter correspondence. That's why they can't decode. That's why they can't manage syntax. That's why they don't remember the directions and such. 
So anyway, that's a really fast overlook of the cast. You can measure it with a 20 minute, really short version, 40 minute version or a 60 minute version and you can get the executive function measure there. So I think that if you really want to know if a student has an executive function problem, it has to be that, that the CAS yields low scores on these, on these scales. If the child has all the behaviors of EF, but not a cognitive explanation, I argue that that's not an EF problem, that's a behavioral problem. By the way, we do have a digital version of the CAS. It's in norming right now. And if you're interested in making a little extra money and getting to see the CAS up front and really learn it uh, and get paid actually to learn it, um, I encourage you to go on the website for ProEd and sign up for, for the um, CAS2 online version. I'm gonna kind of flip this over because I have mentioned dyslexia already, but I wanna share this case with you. This was a case done by my co-author, Eric Pickering. Whenever I show you cases, I show you kids, but it's never the real kids, of course. But um, this was a boy that Eric evaluated and he was really, um, he was really struggling. He was, he, he was good at some things, but got poor grades. He was frustrated. He was really struggling in a lot of ways. Um, sometimes he got really into things and that and that worked pretty well. But here's what Eric found when he tested him. First of all, Cephi planning, the CAS2 EEF, the attention score and simultaneous were all above 90. Reading comprehension, math reasoning, right around 90. Math calculation, successive processing, and decoding all in the 80s. This is a student with dyslexia, but he's good in EF. So what we do is we use that strength to help him notice and manage the tasks that demand successive processing. Think about it. You can talk to 10 year olds about this. They get it. I've had kids that young say, yeah, I just can't do that kind of thing. They know it somehow. They live it. And if you help them recognize their strengths, use the strengths to manage the weaknesses. Now you've engaged the student in the solution in a way that's lifelong. That's what you want. So I always render scores that we get within this triangle. High scores at the top, low cognitive score, the low and successive. This is for the case of Ben. Good simultaneous planning and tension, low successive. And then here are his academics. So we have these two discrepancies, discrepancies among PISS, discrepancies between good processing scores and academic failure. But what's really important is the consistency between low processing and low academics. It's not a coincidence. This is how you define a learning disability. Because you have here a disorder in one or more of the basic psychological processes. Just like the regs describe. And when you lay out the information like this in this triangle to teachers, parents, students, it changes everything. I, I have to tell you, I was in San Francisco about six months ago speaking at the Learning in the Brain conference. And um, there was a guy there. I didn't really recognize him, but he he remembered me. And he came over to me 
And he's like, Dr. Naglier, I have to tell you what happened. I was working on this case last week and the parents, it, it was like a um, late middle, middle, middle school, early uh, high school age. I can't remember exactly the age, but it was a student that had been evaluated lots of times before and no one ever was able to figure out what the heck was going on. And the parents were really frustrated and angry at the school because things weren't working out. And he gave the cast and he found out exactly what was wrong. Just like a case like this, he put it in the triangle, he showed it to the parents and the parents were like, thank you. You're the first person to ever explain to me what exactly is going on with my son in terms that I can understand and with things that I can manage, strengths, to deal with the weaknesses. That's what happens when you have a theory that drives your interpretation. Think about our field. We've been encouraged to look at all kinds of subtest relationships and all this and kind of figure out what the subtests measure and all that kind of stuff. That's not necessary on the CAS. We know what the subtests measure. They each measure one of the four processes. We validated that time and time again. That gives you so much strength to make good decisions about kids. Decisions that really matter. By the way, if you go on my website, you can download this free analyzer. Actually, I have analyzers that compare PISS scores to all the different achievement tests that are out there. And it tests the significance of the differences between the scores. And if the differences are significant, then they'll be described as discrepant. If not, they're, they'll be consistent. And there's some other rules that are used, but it'll build a triangle for you. And it, it'll tell you whether you have strengths or weaknesses in PISS and everything else. It's free. It's a spreadsheet. You can't mess it up. It's locked. The only place you can put the numbers is in the yellow boxes. <laughs> so don't worry about that. It's locked and secure. All right. So what we do with Ben is we go to my Helping Children Learn book and we talk to him about how to be smart. Think smart, use a plan. He's good at that, so he's gonna to resonate to that. What does it mean to be smart? Oh, you can talk to him about all that. All of this is kid language. And then we talk about, okay, how can you be smarter? Sorry, I think I must have gone the wrong direction on my mouse here. You teach him about successive processing. You teach him why these certain tasks are hard. And then you talk about things to do about it. But what do you, what exactly is a skill? What, what does that mean exactly? Um, think about what's a skill. A skill is something that you know so well, you could do it automatically. It's like very, we might say you're fluent. Driving a car is a skill that you have. You don't really have to think about it too much. You just do it autom you know, automatically, so, so to speak. But think about this. If executive function is thinking about how you do what you do, how could that be a skill? Because skills are things that you do without thinking about it. Skills are things that you've been taught and then you can just execute. When you're using EF, you're not retrieving knowledge in that same way, you might say, I need more knowledge to figure out what to do. But if you're just solving the task by just doing what somebody told you to do, that's not EF. EF requires thinking and skills aren't. In Nickelberg's book, he raises a very important point about EF. What he says is EF is gonna be so critically important whenever you're in a novel situation. In other words, you don't know how to do something you wanna do. 
of course, this occurs all the time when you're learning something new. But once you've learned the task, then EF is not so important, and that's where skills come in. And that's why these double curves are so important. I'll give you an example. You all know how to drive a car. You all drove to get wherever you are today, and that was easy. Did you ever drive in Australia or New Zealand or in England? Yeah. You know how to drive, but you don't know how to drive. <laughs> it is so different. And you have to use your EF to the max. It is crazy. Plus, you, don't have, you don't have the skills. <laughs> Yeah, so just keep in mind, whenever you're in a situation where all of a sudden you're not sure what to do, EF dominates. Now let's think about this for a second. Wasn't COVID really hard? Why was COVID hard? For a lot of reasons, but not the least of which, we couldn't do anything without thinking about it. We had to think about every damn thing. Couldn't even go to the grocery store trying to figure out how am I going to manage that and not get COVID. Everything we did became so very difficult because we didn't have routines and procedures that we would do effortlessly. Remember, Phineas was emotionally messed up. And there's a lot of good research on the relationship between emotional disorders and the frontal lobes. Take a look at Steve Pfeiffer's really good books on this topic. Again, Nick Goldberg. I want to share with you a couple of things and then we'll, we'll end. Um, there's some really good evidence that EF is strongly related to academic performance. In these two studies involving thousands of children who represent the US population, we showed that not only is EF strongly related to academic achievement, but that PASS, the four processes, are very highly correlated with achievement and they correlate higher than, let me skip that and that and that and this, get to this. The, this meta-analysis that was done, published recently, they found that the pass scores across like 65 different um, data sets, PASS correlations with achievement were, hot, were stronger than the correlations reported in previous meta-analyses for all other measures of intelligence. In other words, past processes matter. If you're weak in any one of those, that's likely to have an impact on your academic performance. And to show you that, I want to show you This slide here, um, this is from a paper that Tulio Otero and I just published um, about a few months ago. And these profiles on the CAS, look here all the way on the right, ADHD, low in planning, the executive function, right? Dyslexia, low in successive, like I've mentioned. Children with autism, low in attention, not that they can't attend, they can't shift. But look what happens on the risk for these three different kinds of populations. Just mishmash, WJ, really bad, ABC, really bad. The only test that yields distinctive profiles was the cast. These profiles are what's driving those correlations to achievement. There's a relationship between all of that. I also want to remind you about something else. If you're concerned about equitable assessment of intelligence, the CAS is the most equitable test. And by equitable, we look at mean score differences 
this is all the research I could find on race and ethnic differences on all these different tests. And it's very clear. All the traditional tests that demand knowledge yield big differences between five and 10 points, whereas the tests that don't demand knowledge, three to four points. So if you're concerned about equity, passes the tool um, that you should use. And I have a little surprise for you. I'm gonna take some questions and then I'm gonna end with a song. A song that I played at my uh, Legends uh, interview. But I just realized I told you I would show you this, Sex Differences. So this is a collection of very different things. So we have Sefi ratings by parents and teachers. We have SEL, my, de de my DESA scores by parent raters or teacher raters. And we have planning and attention on the CAS. And look at the differences between males and females. I know the women in the audience are like, I keep telling them we're smarter than you guys. Right? That's what my wife always likes to say. See that? But simultaneous and successive, no real differences. When you look across all these different things, EF direct uh, from the CEFI, SEL scores, planning and attention, they're all supposed to be EF, right? That's what I said to you today. And look, they get the same kind of gender differences. What's compelling about this is that despite the fact that these are different expressions of EF, they function the same way. So that's why I, I say, if you're going to do a comprehensive evaluation, if you're gonna do an evaluation of EF, make it comprehensive, make sure you measure all these dimensions and make sure you use the CAS. So as you can tell, from this you know, short little interaction with me, I'm really about change. I'm trying to initiate change in our field away from a hundred year old technology. I mean, do you really want to whisk six? Do you really want another version of WJ and another version of the Benet? The tests go back a hundred plus years. It doesn't make any sense. And you know who is most important in, in, in admit, initiating change? It's not me. It's you, all of you in this room today. The young people who have to stand up and say, we want something, a second generation. That's what the cast is, a second generation. And um, at the end of my Legends talk, I, I sang a little song that kind of encapsulates that I'm going to Play that and then we'll be done uh, for the night. Maybe it's time to let the old ways die. Maybe it's time to let the old ways die. Takes a lot to change, it takes a lot to try. Maybe it's time to let the old ways die. Well, that's all I have for today. Good night, everybody. Have a good rest of the evening.